Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Charlton Lyre, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. This is our weekly group therapy session. My name uh, is Louis Mendez. On this week's show, we'll be looking back at yesterday's 2-0 defeat at Reading in the massive relegation six-pointer and Nathan Jones's first game that sees the Addicts drop to level with the relegation zone. We're only out of it now on goal difference. We will also be discussing the fact that the Addicts skipper, George Dobson, is set to sign... Uh, for a Hungarian side, Berhova, on uh, it sounds like on Monday he's flying out to have a medical and get that all signed and sealed uh, as well. So we're going to be talking about those things. Joining me uh, on the show, in typical cheery mood, at the top of the screen there is uh, Ben Cloak. How you doing, Ben? Uh, um, I'm not good, because if you're a Charlton fan, you surely can't be good on this very Sunday morning. Yeah, we can't even like, I can't even, I haven't got the energy to pretend I care enough about rugby to laugh at the fact England beat Wales yesterday, and Tom's not even here to be annoyed by that, so no, I'm not happy. Also, put on the screen is Joe Puddyfoot. How are you doing, Joe? <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm good. I've saved the rugby to watch today after this to uh, sort of check, turn my weekend around, so um, <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that is the one bright side, but yeah, yesterday was a, uh, a, a bad day, but I, you know, I do think still reasons to be positive. Um, and I'm clutching at various, various straws, but there are some potentially. Oh, I'm, I'm massively interested to find out what they could possibly be as the show continues. So, yeah, well, Joe will fill us in on that. Uh, so, we're going to hear the goals uh, shortly from uh, yesterday's defeat uh, over at Reading. Uh, I could play the same goal twice, really, couldn't you? You wouldn't know the difference because they're very similar goals that we conceded twice. Uh, we're going to hear from Nathan Jones, the new Addicts boss, after his first game. I spoke to him. Uh, pitch side after yesterday's game. We've got a guest fan joining us later. Callum Alston is going to join us to give us his opinions on, on what's been going on uh, with the Addicts over the last few weeks. I want to hear from you guys as well. Morning to everyone in the chat. Uh, Frankie, Bernie, Ray's in there. Uh, Alan, Keith, Jacob, um, Andrew, James, JC, man like Mark. There's loads of you in there. Um, let's know your views on yesterday's performance. Um, are we are we doomed? Uh, do you still hold hope that, that we can recover from this, this uh, little blip we're in? Um, of 13 games without a win, 19 games without a clean sheet. You know, just a little blip. Um, yeah, let us know what you make about George Dobson potentially leaving, uh, well, well, leaving uh, as well. Oh, goodness me. Yeah, have your say. Email studio at charltonlive.co.uk. Tweet us at charltonlive or put your comments in the live chat. Before we hear the goals then, Ben, um, we travelled there full of hope yesterday. Um, nearly 3,000 uh, of us in the away end, you know, the new manager bounce we were expecting. It was going to be a huge atmosphere, and it was for the first few minutes when the side came out okay, but it just it filtered out into just a really, uh, another massively disappointing performance. We conceded two very sloppy goals. We're now level on points with Port Vale, who are in the relegation zone, and they've got two games in hand on us. Um, I, I, we're in massive, massive trouble here, and speaking to quite a lot of people on trains back yesterday a lot of people are very nervous that that we we are going to go down now um i mean we we had our own little group therapy session on the train home with with mads and lee uh, if, for anyone who knows those guys um and mad mads told us that he, he thinks well he used quite an interesting turn of phrase he thinks that we're all going to be calcium for the worms before Charlton get back in the premier league which was a long discussion that you had to be there for which also made no sense but basically everyone feels like we're doomed ben yeah, do you know what? I think I'm on the doomsday train. I I really think we should go to Joe very soon because I want to see these positives that he got from yesterday. Because, yeah, for me, it was very similar to Derby. I think we could have been out there for another couple of hours and we wouldn't have scored a goal. We were really lacking in creativity, weren't we? Uh, I think our only shot on target came from a tight angle, which Button saved with his legs. And he's not the greatest of keepers, is he? And we we didn't trouble him at all. Yeah, I think at half time talking to a few friends, we were all, we were all quite downbeat there. To be honest, there wasn't really anything to get behind. You were right. I think we started the first what five ten minutes quite well. We were winning a couple of free kicks. I think we won a corner, and we thought, okay, the players seem up for it. Um, and then Reading, I think. There's no way they're getting relegated. I mean, with this point deduction they've got, they're on the right, um, and it's knocked them down in a false position, really. Um, but the players they've got, um, I mean, uh, Aziz caused us problems all day, obviously scored two good goals. They were very well structured as a team. I think we found it hard to break them down. Um, 
And yeah, I think they just grew into the game. Whereas for us, you could see the players were lacking in confidence. I don't think any of our players really wanted um, to take the game um, too red in. Like when we had uh, space in front of us, it was almost as if they were passing the blame to someone else. And we just, I mean, I thought Backinson and was was all right, actually, to give him his due. I thought whenever he got the ball, he did look forward and was trying to take us forward. But when we're playing that formation, we had no width to turn to. I mean, Watson and Eden sometimes weren't even there. They were dropped back. And, and when we did get down the sides, I mean, Eden at one point had three chances to cross it in the spell of like 30 seconds and couldn't be the first man. It was like, I just... For, for Jones' sake, I'm not going to start having a go at him, but I just thought after watching the game last week and seeing how we just couldn't create anything and we've got no width in this side, to then play that same formation with the same two fullbacks that had no joy against Derby, had equally no joy yesterday. It was like, how what have we been doing to kind of create chances, at least on the training pitch? Mm. Um week because that's where we're struggling isn't it we haven't replaced Corey and we whereas before we were scoring goals and conceding some we don't even look like scoring a goal now do we yep we have massive 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 problems well, let's listen back to some goals unfortunately they're both went in the other net uh yesterday this is the commentary highlights of the defeat at reading from charlton tv terry smith and greg stubbley towards the near post Hackinson gets something on it drops down and it's finished by Aziz, what could be a vital goal for Reading. Charlton will now have to come from behind if they're going to take anything from this game. We've got to deal with another long throw coming in here from the Reading right-hand side. In towards the penalty area, headed on by Bindon. Watson with the head of Claire, but it drops to Aziz. No, is that, yeah, it is Aziz. It's away from Tanae Watson, there's no real conviction in that. And it's two goals Sean have conceded from effectively a set piece. It's a long throw, it's a set piece. You'll get relegated if you can't defend away from home. You'll get relegated. We, our defending this season has not been good enough. And these are examples, and you feel for, for Nathan Jones, he's got a big task on his hands. Yeah, I think Stubbers said it there. If I'm sure he didn't, but if Nathan did come in with any misgivings about exactly how dire the situation is now then he, he certainly won't won't still be be misunderstanding that after yesterday joe because i mean ugh, i'm i'm really looking forward to hearing these positives mate because i ain't got none from yesterday i ain't got none i ain't got none from the last few weeks at all help help me here joe all right so i was thinking about it this morning um trying to find a shred of positivity and it tells you how far Charlton have gone this season downhill that I've become the voice of positive reasoning on Charlton Live because I've always been the more negative one. Um, the 3 5 2 as a formation doesn't work for us. We we all know that. Holden got sacked because he was persisting with it at the start of the season. And only the tactical genius that is Michael Appleton could have thought that the solution to his problems was copying Dean Holden. Um, so we've gone to 3 5 2 with. Everybody that is a Charlton fan would have said our weakest area in the squad was fullbacks. They're not very good going forwards. They're not very good going backwards. And they're pretty dire when they're stood still. So they're not the people that are going to create your opportunities and your chances and drive your team forward. So a formation that relies heavily on them was never, ever going to be a successful one. And the strategy where we keep the ball out of our net and try and nick a goal was never going to be one that was going to work for us because we are so poor defensively. So if you take all of that, you've got to find a way of playing that enables people who have the ability on the ball to dominate the game for us. And, and we're going to have to beat some teams up physically. That's what a lot of teams down the bottom do. They, they, go, they go more sort of bundle about, beat teams up, time waste, be dirty, get your points on the board, get through the season, worry about the reset in the summer. And I think that Jones will have the ability to identify that problem in the squad. He stuck with the formation that he saw. Why would you rip up everything in, in week one as a manager? Uh, but we do know that he has played other formations previously. And I think that we're going to have to go to that. In addition, you had Pan coming back yesterday. He looked 
uh, cut above. If you can keep him fit, there's one straw we're clutching at. That will be a difference maker. If you can get a Nike to give you a six-game cameo off the bench, there's potentially 12 points there that, that could be season-defining. He, he did it at the start of the season. So um, if you can get that, again, that, that will definitely be another strength. And you do have, for all of the problems that you've got, teams in League One are crap. And one team will go on a dreadful run above us. Um, so we've got to... You can almost kiss goodbye to Port Vale if you really want to, because they've got the games in hand and Reading. You've only got to find one team above you that is going to go on a dire run that you can get more. So Joe, points you on. do you, you do realise that we are that team and we've we've been doing it for everyone else. That's why yeah, we're in we it. Have. So someone sent me a stat today. So if we don't win on Tuesday, we will have the longest winless run in the division this season. So bear in mind Cheltenham went something like eleven games at the start of the season without even scoring a goal. Like we, like I, 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 I'm getting to the stage now. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I really hope that something will turn, and I think maybe, maybe Chuck's coming back is all we can hope for. But we've all been saying it all season. There's a lot of dross down the bottom of League One. It's us. Like it's become us. I'm really, I'm really, really worried now that I think. You know, Ben mentioned you mentioned it there about about the the, the selling of of Corey Black attack. The whole January window has been a disaster. If we're being honest, you know, I, I said at the at the end of the window, I was you know concerned, and we'll see how we see how it plays out. We, we've taken Corey out the side, and I was hoping you know Ladapo will come in and create his own chances. He's, he's he's not been up to speed at all. You know, Coventry hasn't really done as much as we'd hoped from from him we, we've we've now just got no creativity um the defensive errors haven't been ironed out yet you know th- i'm sort of thinking it through last night and and cast my mind back to sort of december when michael appleton was saying it's laughable now but you know we just got to keep keep in touch with the playoffs six seven eight points then january will sort us out so we actually we we, we laid a lot of a lot of hope on january ben and it's, it's made us, you could argue it's made us worse. It's certainly not made us better. So that's that's why I think over the last few weeks, it's become clear that the hope we had to become a better team, whether that was to go from mid-table to the playoffs or to sit in mid-table or whatever, has not has not played out how it should do. And now we're, and now we're obviously potentially talking about Dobbo going tomorrow as well. So... I fear we've weakened ourselves at the worst, the worst possible time, and I fear we've sleep, we've slept walked into this this relegation battle, Ben. And unless something changes quite dramatically in the next fifteen games, we are going down. <laughs> oh, mate! I was thinking back to the start of the season earlier when Dobson scored that goal against Lake Norrie and is patting the chest, and we're thinking, okay, it wasn't the greatest performance. But um, we started with a win, so that's good. And now, like, Dobson's about to leave us and we are staring down the barrel of relegation. How have we got to this position? And I do think back to the start of the season, and for me, our best, well, obviously our best player was Jez. And we never replaced him at the start of the season. We never brought in a winger that could do what he was doing. Don't get me wrong, he was an amazing player for us. So that was the hardest job we had to do was to try and replace him. But we didn't even try, did we? I don't even think we were linked with any wingers to kind of come in. And then, as you say, we got to January and, yeah, the whole deal with Corey and Dobbo's contracts running out, that was the big story, wasn't it? Okay, we wanted players to come in and improve us, but as you kept saying, well, I think we said it a lot on the pod. I know Corey got um, a bit of dog's abuse from the crowd because he consistently couldn't do it. Um, But then now, I think we're looking and going, well, yeah, look, he couldn't consistently do it. We haven't got that at all now. So where are we getting this creativity from? And the likes of Fiorini um, and Backinson were supposed to come in and provide this creativity for us. Um, But, I mean, Fiorini wasn't even on the bench yesterday. Um, But there again, it comes with changing the manager in this window with different setups of how they want to play. As uh, Joe alluded to earlier, it does look like we want to play this diamond formation because we haven't got any wingers. But, yeah, if you haven't got your strikers in Ladapo, who, yeah, we hoped because he wasn't someone that was injured, he, he came into the squad playing bits and bit part football at Ipswich and he was coming on scoring goals off the bench. We thought he would come into this squad 
and be raring to go. But that's not been the case, has it? So oh, it's going to be a massive struggle now um, because I think teams can easily find us out because we're very one-dimensional how we want to play. Uh yeah, as you said, January was a bit of a nightmare and I'm sure we'll come on to it with Dobbo in a bit later. But yeah, you're taking two the players that were consistently playing well now out of our squad and they've not been, uh, well, especially in Corey's case, they've not been replaced. And the other players, i.e. Coventry, Backinson, um, coming into Dobbo's position, might go on to do well. But in a case where we just badly need to pick up some points... At the moment, it's just not working for him. Mm. Um, the goals yesterday, Joe, uh, two long throws, like, so similar. The, fir the first one, I think it was Backinson and Terrell Thomas who both sort of got caught underneath it. Um, and it, therefore, it bounced into Femi Aziz's path completely unmarked because they both got sucked towards the ball. Left, uh, therefore, quite a big gaping hole on, on the left-hand edge of our six-yard box. Uh, good finish from him. The second one, another long throw, this time flicked on Tanai's what Tanai Watson's header. Um, effectively landed on the penalty spot. I mean, it's like it's like it's like giving someone a penalty. <laughs> He'd like to have a shot from six yards out. And to be fair to Aziz, the second one was a proper ping. It was it was a lovely finish. But again, like you you, you can't you can't be doing that defense. You can't be making that defensive header in that situation. But we do those sort of errors consistently, and that's why we're now 19 games without a clean sheet, um, which is just remarkable, really. And you, you're not going to win games if you do that. If you can't do the basics, as Nathan Jones says, that's why we're in a big a big mess yesterday. Even when like so, I thought Lloyd Jones actually came in and played quite well. So even when someone comes in and shores things up, we've got mistakes in us all day long. Like it, it keeps happening. And I don't see how Nathan can actually iron stuff like that out. Is it? Does it come down to the quality of the player? I think it does come down to quality of the player. We do. <clears throat> we have also signed a, a number of defensive players um, in January, and we are chopping and changing that back line all of the time. Um, so it doesn't particularly help anybody in terms of getting consistency and understanding of who's taking what role and um, stuff like that. But this. this problem has been plaguing us for a long long time now <clears throat> i think it comes down to professional pride um and a desire to to want to keep a clean sheet i don't think there's enough players in that defense at the minute that that embody that eden and watson are, are great examples of that in the number of times that they broke down <clears throat> our left hand side and eden was narrower than gillespie yesterday that is just not wanting to be out there and, and doing your work and Watson headed the ball to for one chance, played a through ball for another that they should have done better with. So you, you are unpicking yourself. But we've got to find a way to, to be more dominant in games and surer at the back. And that is going to be tricky to do. That's why, for me, I think that we need to focus probably on trying to score more goals than the opposition as opposed to trying to keep a clean, clean sheet. Because I you don't see where another clean sheet is coming from. And if you're not posing anyone any problems, then they can just attack you over and over again. If you're saying, well, okay, keep May and the Dapo and Watson quiet and no one else is going to create anything. So don't worry about it, lads. You know, as long as they're, those three are marks, you've got seven players left to go and go and attack. So that's the, that's going to be the challenge, but the, the system and it doesn't, I don't think the system suits the players. I don't think chopping and changing suits. We need to get some consistency, some patterns of play, but the players need to look at themselves first. They're, mm. they're the ones letting us down at the minute. Yeah, I mean, Jay says we've been rubbish defensively for the past three seasons. The problem is the goals have now dried up. Yeah, and that's one way of looking at it. Obviously, as, as we said, the goals and chances have dried up. Corey, Corey going, it was a gamble in January, and it's it's just a gamble that's not paid off. You know, and again, I understand the, the business sense of it, because there's money, there was money to be made, and he was coming to the end of his contract, and he wasn't going to sign a new one. So I understand there's a business sense to it, but I guess that's where you have to balance it up with: Do you need him bef until the end of the season? I think, like I say, it just hasn't paid off because we've put ourselves right in the mix now, right in the mix to go down to League Two, which would which would just be a massive disaster for the club. There's no there's no two ways around it. I've been in League One's a disaster for the club, but going down to League Two. You know, it, it's, it poses a lot of questions, certainly, doesn't it? Um, yeah, Andrew's saying that defence is missing an absolute leader who takes charge and marshals his partners in crime uh, against uh, defending currently. Yeah, um, going forwards, there, there was very little. I think maybe Dan had a couple of moments when he came on, didn't he, late on, 
There was one where he was flagged offside when he when he tried to poke the ball across to face a goal. Um, yeah, we had the Ladapo chance right on a stroke of half time that a few of us thought was in actually from for, certainly from the ang- those of us who were sat on the side stand, so the away end that came round and those of us in the press box it did look for a, a brief moment it might it might have drifted in the near post, but yeah, they they were few and far between Ben and that that again it comes down to I mean if you look at our last three games, so Blackpool we scored for a lucky deflection own goal. And then we've gone, we've gone those two games um, w- without scoring now against Derby and, and against Reading. So, yeah, Alf- Alfie's on one in ten, I think it is. Um, Ladapo's on none in however many he's played. Obviously, like both ends of the pitch, we're really struggling, and and the middle as well. We're, we're struggling literally in the whole pitch, Ben. That's a that that's that's not a good sign, is it? Oh, mate, yeah, we could talk about every aspect of the pitch, couldn't we? Um... But yeah, you talk about that chance with Ladapo. That actually came from what I was saying earlier, where Watson, Ten I Watson, saw some space in front of him and actually ran towards that space, drew defenders away from him, passed it to Ladapo. He cut inside, and you go, oh, okay, that was a good passage of play. Um, you think, let's have some more of that, where where players take responsibility of the ball. I know they're low on confidence, but. If you're just going to boot it, I mean, that first goal with the throw on came because I remember turning to my mate and going, what is he doing? Where Terrell Thomas had acres of space in front of him and you're part of a back three. So one of you has got to use that role to run forward, surely. So he started to run forward with the ball and then just thought, I'm going to hoof it up there. To their giant centre-backs, to Ladapo, he's not controlling anything, and to one of the smallest strikers in the league. And that ball came straight back at him about 10 seconds later. We headed it out of play and they scored from that throw on. And it was just, that was the spells we were going through where we would have little glimpses of a 10 I Watson run or an Eden run. And we thought, okay, let's keep this going. Use that space. And then we just resorted back to a a long hoof up front because no one wants to take responsibility of it. And we're back in that same situation. And obviously they'll exploit that. They'll probably leave players like that like, um, well, look, he's just going to give it to us. And that's that's what was happening. Where Joe, I did like a positive from Joe because I agreed with Pan Kamara come on. I thought, yeah, he did look like a class above. Um, he's someone who we've massively missed this season. Again, we can't pin all our hopes on him because of his injury record of late. But no, he did look really good. And as you said, that little chance for Kanu, that I forgot about that because I kind of got excited and then thought, oh, and then he was offside. Um, yeah. So if we try it, we've got to try and look for glimpses here of hope as Joe was trying to do, because this is going to become very depressing. Mm. Um, and try and get some excitement going for Tuesday in in such such a massive game. I mean, wow, if we cannot win that, then I think it's going to be on a slump on the floor. Uh, I just don't I just don't feel it. That's the problem. The problem is like you just not you're not seeing you, we're not in many games at the moment where you you, you come away from it and, and over the 90 minutes you think yeah we probably could have we probably deserve to win that i just not seeing it at all you know and this was uh, yes it's a red inside who despite obviously being below us in the table are on a, de- a decent run of form but you know that we 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 have to be a team on a decent run of form at some point and it just doesn't look like it's it's happening uh, at the moment um we're just going to hear from Nathan in, in a few seconds time joe but i mean is his first game what 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 do you think he would have taken from it? Because I, I remember I've said this to many a manager over the years because I've had to interview about fifty of them in the last few weeks. But um, you, I guess you always learn more about your side when you actually see them play rather than when they're when they're training against their. They, they probably look great when they're training against our defense, our, our strikers and stuff. They probably. Um, so would, yeah, what do you think he learned? He learned from yesterday. I think he would have. I think he would have learned that ultimately we we need to find a way to to pose a threat in the final third of the minute. Um, and, and we're not able to do that. Uh, he also would have learned that there's a real lack of fight um, and passion in, in that squad at the minute and, and a real lack of confidence as well. As soon as that first Reading goal went in, it game was over until Carnu c- came on and sort of got in and about it. Um, hopefully he's looking back at that game, looking at the players and thinking... I can't. You probably can't change anything for Tuesday because I don't have any time on the training pitch. You can't send them out in a new formation with a new system and and expect it to look any good. But hopefully, he's got um, enough out of that to start planning for the following Saturday and getting some some way to get these players to gel and be cohesive. But 
he is going to have to find a way to motivate these players and get into them psycho psychologically and to make them fight harder, show more passion, show more desire and have confidence despite the fact that they've lost how many games on the trot now. But you've got to find a way to, to almost fake it until you make it. And one result could turn that round, but he needs a win soon in order to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, one of the points we were making in the press box just chatting before the game yesterday was with, with the build-up. We said it ourselves, like with the build-up to the game on Thursday, you know, and in, in the crowd, like before the game, it had a big game feel, you know, bigger way end. Quite a few were in when the players came out to warm up and they were getting the, the atmosphere going early. Like the fans played their part, you know, until until it became obvious that it was going to be terrible. <laughs> and, then, and then obviously they, they, they sort of quietened down a little bit because everyone was just so miserable watching it. Um, and the the deflating feeling, or after all that build up to come out into the into that performance, like it, it's taken a massive bit of the shine off. Yeah, and that's not necessarily Nathan Jones's fault because it's one game in, but it's taken a, a big bit of the shine off his appointment because everyone was very excited when, when he came in. So yeah, he, he he needs something sooner rather than later before all that goodwill is lost, you know, and it's goodwill that's garnered towards the team because of Nathan's arrival because everyone was excited to see him here. So that 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 needs to be fixed as soon as possible. Let's hear. Uh, from the Addicts boss. When we come back, obviously, we'll talk about George Dobson uh, and his move to Hungary uh, as well. But I spoke to Nathan Jones uh, after yesterday's defeat at Reading, his first Charlton game. Uh, this is what he had to say. Uh, Nathan, a defeat in your first game as Charlton manager. How did you see it today? Uh, look, I learned a lot. Uh, we didn't do the basics well enough on, on a few occasions. They gave me everything in terms of thing, but I've, I've learned quite a lot. And as I said, we'll, we'll take... Uh, take something from it um, and make sure that we, we improve for Tuesday. Yeah, I guess it was only a few days on the training ground, but you get to see a lot more when you actually see them. Oh, it's the only way you learn because it's a controlled environment on the training ground. They train with each other. They're not out of their comfort zone. This is when they bring them out of their comfort zone. And you learn quite a lot, and, and we have today. Is there, is there any players that sort of stood out for you as, as something that you've seen, stuff you didn't expect from them or, or anything along no, those lines? No, look, you know, I thought Panu it's good to have Panucci back. I thought DK did well when he came on in terms of looked a threat. And, and we have to be, we have to be better in, in terms of what we've done. I've learned a lot about certain people who I can play, or how, how I can play with those people. And then and then we go from there. And obviously one element of the side that has struggled over, over the course of the season is, is keeping goals out, 19 games without a clean sheet. So again, you knew that was going to be something that you have to work on. Uh, absolutely. But if you do the basics well, you can win football games. And we're not doing the basics well enough now. So that, that has to improve. I mean, look, we're undone today from two long throws. And... It already scored in midweek from a long throw, so it's not something that that wasn't put there. But look, that's that's a, that's, that's a learning curve for us. We we have to learn quickly because you know we can't keep keep not winning a game, and that's that's a frustrating thing. I guess the benefit is there's still 15 games left to go. This is not five games left to go to try and get your messages across. Oh, absolutely. You know, it, it would be a different game if we if we had if it's five games to go. It'd probably a different setup in terms of that. But we have to learn quickly about them and then and, and then make judgments from there. So your first, your first uh, meeting with the Chomp fans for a while, what, what did you make of them today? Uh, they were numbers? excellent. They were outstanding. Look, we're, we're disappointed we couldn't give them something to get behind because they'll go home and thinking, well, you know, but look, you can't, everything won't change in one in one week. It won't change in four training sessions. It won't change in one game. It's We have to build, but we have to build quickly. I'll just ask about Gillespie came off at half-time. Is he still having these minutes managed with his hamstring? Or? Well, look, he's, he's not used to playing games in, in terms of stuff. So we started him because of, of, of certain things, but we wanted, it was a tactical change in the end. Yet yeah, we've got to, you know, we've got to make Sure that he he doesn't get pushed beyond his his, his limits in certain st stuff, but um, yeah, it was a, look, it was a tactical change. I felt that that it would have given us something different uh, um, with with Terrell. Terrell's probably slightly more athletic, so we can we can bump people and and and, and things. So it's, it's about me finding out about what I can ask from people because yep, yeah, they can do it in training, but in games. You know, that's that's when we learn. And now George Johnson today, is he still struggling with his injury? Well, he's just re 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 coming back, really, in terms of that. So we'll we'll find out about more about him, you know, tomorrow when we're in training. Uh, Tuesday at Link, uh, home game against Lincoln, that becomes a massive game and the first one at the Valley for you. Look, they're all massive games now in terms of that. But this one at the Valley, we want to put on a performance. We want to do well, and 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 and, and let's see. And we'll you know we'll. we'll I, I'm sure we'll be better than we were today in terms in and out of possession. Um, but we have to take a lot of the positives from today uh, and just try and be better on every little level that we that we can. In terms of Harry in goal, what was the thinking? Obviously, I know that the team's been conceding quite a few goals, but 
what was the decision making on the goalkeeper? Just probably I know him a little bit better. I know when I ask certain, do certain stuff. I know Harry. Harry, I've worked with Harry three, four years, so, so I know, you know, I know him. That's all it was. I think, you know, Ashley's done done well. He's actually one of the best for for, for, for saves and stuff. I just felt Harry knows, it's, you know, the starting positions I asked for him, the proactivity I need. He's just a little bit more up to speed. Nothing on Ashley because I think he's been good. You know, he's, he, I don't think he's made many errors at all. He's made saves. Just sometimes you go with a bit of familiarity, and I thought Harry was excellent yeah, today. He, he was, size, didn't yeah, he? yeah. And in terms of yourself, not the result you wanted, not the result anybody wanted. But did you still enjoy, did you still enjoy it? Is it good to be back out there? Oh, absolutely. You don't enjoy the result and so on, but then you have what you have to do is be philosophical about it. You can't be down and and be ranting and raving constantly because that doesn't help those in there. What you have to do is learn quickly. We have to look at what we did did well, look at what where we could be better and go from there. And we will get better. That's, that's the thing. Thinking about a new kitchen or bathroom? Find professional, independent local installers with free home surveys, itemised quotes and protected payments, trading standards approved contracts and workmanship warranties. The British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom, Bathroom Installations accredits installers to ensure they are police checked, fully insured and experienced. Take the risk out of home improvement. Visit bikbbi.org.uk Hello fellow addicts. I'm so excited to tell you all about our micropub, The River Owl House. The River Owl House is based in East Greenwich. It has six pub of the year awards, an ever-changing selection of amazing beer it's owned by Charlton fans, walkable to the ground in just 20 minutes with buses that go direct to the Valley too. If your match day routine includes a drink with your friends, you must join your fellow addicts in the river. See you soon. Right, welcome back to Charlton Live on your Sunday morning. Before the break there, we just heard from the new addicts boss, uh, Nathan Jones, after defeating his first game that leaves uh, Charlton sitting j- uh, only just outside the relegation zone on goal difference. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he said he would have learnt a lot from yesterday, Ben. Uh, obviously, he, he, he'll he'll know as as much as anyone that he's, he's got to learn quickly because we're running out of time. I, as I said to him, it's fifteen games and not five games left, so there is still time to turn this around. But there's been very little indication over the last few weeks that the players have got it in him, so he's got to find something that, that the last few bosses haven't. Yeah, I like the fact that he was saying that um, when you see players in a game environment, you do see a different side to them as before he was saying in, in the training sessions, because that, that is one thing for us. I mean, we've heard a lot of these new players that have come into our squad with the reputation that they've done well in their previous teams in this league, i.e. Gillespie, Edmonds Green, uh, people like that. We're just not seeing that ability come out in, in games. Um, we've chopped and changed different managers and the different managers aren't getting a tune out of this whole squad, let alone individual players. Um, so I think today, if they're training today, I assume they are, it, it could be just little tweaks in, in terms of just the way that we're set up and the structure of the way we're set up that, that might just help um, add an arm around these players to try and get the best out of them. Um, I mean, yesterday, one thing I noticed, like last 15 minutes and yeah, we're, we're two nil down trying to just get something, a shot off, any deflection, um, a quick throw before they come back. I mean, there just wasn't that desire from those players to go for that quick throw. And if we did have the ball, I looked at one point, I was going like, Louis, Alfie, which one are you coming for the ball? And they were just pointing at each other, like just passing the blame. So I think a big thing he's, he has to instill is some confidence from somewhere. Um into these players and and in going into like uh, that's one thing I got from that I think training he might have seen like them expressing themselves more than they would in games um so I think he's got to try and instill that from somewhere as he said like two goals we conceded yesterday they worked on in training and then they concede two goals from mm. that situation um so yeah I think a big thing um and I think that is one big thing about his personality his motivation um, I enjoyed that interview because I think from Appleton, he, he sounded as downbeat as the rest of us. Um, okay, Jones has only had one game, so he's not had it ingrained into him yet. But if we can just try and get that motivation to just galvanise us from somewhere, because there is ability there, we know that. But 
at the moment we're just not seeing it are we at all and that yeah, can't I, be structure that can't be confidence again i'm not i'll still come back and say i don't i don't know if there is enough ability there because we've sold our one player who can create chances for us from what i've seen so far um right let's talk about dobson um on the train home yesterday i tweeted uh that he's set to to fly out uh, on Monday to Hungary uh, for a medical with Fehava, uh, which I probably pronounced incorrectly. Uh, I didn't put exclusive on it because, let's be honest, everyone knew uh, yesterday it was all over social media. But obviously, uh, Richardson clarified it, it, it's going to be a three-year deal by the sounds of it for the addict skipper. Um, where should we start? I mean, the Simon Hollands just uh, tweeted us earlier saying, criticism for Dobbo is unfair. He always gave 100%. has never come across as greedy, just professionally ambitious. Uh, he has a chance for qualifying for European competition in Hungary. Uh, he told me in pre-season that Spain, that the squad was short of players uh, required for a promotion push. Well, that's what Simon's saying then. Obviously, that was still very early at that point in, in the summer. So I don't, I don't know if George changed his mind on that. Um, Joe, how, how do you see this one? So look, everyone knows the story out there. It is clear that, George just George's side don't feel like his his contract offer is enough. Um and, and judging by what, what the club have offered him, they, they think he's not worth more than, than what they've put out there. So that, that seems to be the two sides at play there. Um I've seen a few fans saying George shouldn't be sort of abandoning us at this point. Um I've seen a lot of play a lot of people saying uh, the club and, and Andy Scott should 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 hang their head in shame for hanging their heads in shame for not offering a, a better deal. Which which way do you see it? Um, yeah, I, there's there's no there's no two ways. Well, there is two ways around it. Matt's saying let's not excuse Dobson, the captain, the first one out of the sinking ship. Nobody is forced out. He had a choice, uh, and he made it. But then um, uh, Bradley's saying George would have stayed for nearly half the money going to Hungary, but Scott didn't want to do that deal. Squad player at best, really. He thinks uh, one bloke who is a supporter gets to have that. Who isn't a supporter gets to have that say. So look, there's clearly two sides to it. Um, which way do you see it, Joe? I don't think Dobbo wanted to go personally. I, I don't see that. If you if you compare Dobbo and Blackett Taylor in the back end of December, start of January, there was one player who was desperate to turn the ship around and rolling his sleeves up and, and really getting stuck in. And, and there was one that wasn't. And I felt that Corey had probably down tools a little bit in the in the last few games. And fair enough, you know, he's got his his deal on the table. He, you know, if he wants to go, he wants to go. But I didn't get that impression from from Dobbo. I do think that when you, for all the criticism, is he a captain? Isn't he a captain? You know, has he struggled this season? I think he's been dealt a very rough hand in that midfield. I think there is a player there, but there is a player that cares, that has that passion, that has that fight, that has that desire. And regardless of football ability um, and, and whatever Scott thinks about that, um, you can't, trade those assets away that easily in the position that we're in. I would say if this is a Scott decision, then I think that that's, that should be it for Scott. Because I, I just don't see that you how anyone can watch this squad and think that Dobbo wasn't a core part of it um, for us. And and I and the commentary has come in. I don't see that Coventry is at the standard that Dobbo is now. Whether Coventry's got more potential, maybe. But we're going to be massively lacking that energy. And if Coventry gets injured, who's going to sit in that holding role for us? You know, we're massively, massively short of players that have that fight, that fight, that tackle. He was turning up in the box, trying to drag this team through. Um, and it's a it's a crying shame. And it's a shocking indictment, I think, of the people making the decisions at the upper hierarchy of this club. Mm, yeah, just look at a couple of the comments that came in right at the start of the show. Frankie saying, move it to a, a Hungarian team seems really odd. Uh, even if they are one of the top teams in their league, especially uh, when uh, he says other offers are on the table. Yeah, but again, if, if George didn't think the offer from Charlton was enough, then at some point, you know, players, had, as much as we we like to paint this light of, you know, we all, we're all we're all in it together, players have to look after themselves and, and their livelihood. And this is League One football as well. You, you, you're not talking about, are you moving from one Premier League club to another, where obviously there's lots of different zeros on the end of those numbers, but they're still pretty big numbers to start off with. You know, George won't be won't won't be retiring off what he earns as a League One footballer. That's just not how it works. So there is a decision to make there. Uh, Bernie says he thinks that uh, George has been driven out of the club by by Andy Scott with a derisory a derisory contact uh, contract extension. Ray saying uh, where to start. I guess if Dobson isn't in Jones's plans uh, and he goes in the summer anyway, then we might as well get a, a small fee for letting him go. But it's a big gamble uh, in my eyes and a massive game uh, on on Tuesday. Yeah, uh, do do you th do you think Ben that 
I don't know. Do, do, you, do, do you think if we, if we we should we should have said to George, look, we, you're not going to get a better offer, but also we're not going to sell you because we need you between now and the end of the season? How how, how do you see it? Uh, it's, it's tricky because there's two sides to every story, right? So um, I see the side of George Dobson that <clears throat> came into this football club where Sunderland fans didn't think he was very good. Uh, so he was on the money we brought him in, probably not a big amount because we've taken a chance on him. Um, and he's gone on to prove himself, not just for us, but at the top of the, ch- of the charts for a League One midfielder in his position. Always top of the tackles, the interceptions. Um, I know there's some uh, Twitter sites out there that always put him, like they showed the stats, didn't they? That He was top of his class in his position, right? Okay, in a poor side, but he did that. So he kind of turned around his career um, from being a West Ham Academy player to having, like, dropping down and then proving himself. He's gone on to prove himself to be a captain of this football club. So he probably looks at it now to go, well, look, I think I should be offered more than like I know these players are getting more and I'm the captain so shall I be getting more um I guess he's turned around seeing then other the likes of Coventry and players come in um on permanent deals and maybe getting more money than him and the board probably are looking into the future and going well look Coventry is younger than you he's going to grow into that position that's how much he's going to get so look I can see it from George's side and and I, I'm gutted that he's going because um, in some rubbish years for this football club, he's someone that's shown a lot of passion, a lot of consistency in his performances. OK, he hasn't been the vocal leader that we asked for in a captain, but on the pitch, he's given his all. And I've loved that from him and we've all grown to love him. And I think coming into this squad, he's given us way more than we ever thought he would and grown into a captain. Um, and I think the board are taking a gamble. I think having a ready-made player there in George, who's consistently playing well in this squad, to then go, well, these players in the future will become better than you and consistently play better than you, I think is a gamble because, as we've been saying in this show, we're staring down the barrel of going down to League Two. He's someone that was consistently doing well at the moment. We've got to wait till these players consistently do well. So, yeah, personally, I would have just blocked the move, seen what Jones likes of him um, until the end of the year. Are we going to get that much from him now, for him now, for Hungary? Uh, I don't know. And, and as you said, if we do go down to League Two, um, that money of keeping a player like that, that would be futile, wouldn't it? Because we'd just mm. be like, well, now we're in League Two. Um, getting less money, less fans, and we've gambled a lot in this window, and it's another gamble, in my opinion. Yeah, right. Andrew says uh, Dobbo was the one player who actually seemed to care, a terrible decision to not offer him uh, a decent contract. Cameron saying he's moving to a team for more money and a chance to play in Europe. I'm not sure why people are surprised uh, that he's leaving. It seems like an obvious uh, move. Guy says, uh, ultimately, Corey Blackett-Taylor is the real big loss. Dobbo has been brilliant, but him playing basically every minute hasn't prevented us from being where we are but the impact of losing Corey Blackett-Taylor uh, has been huge Allen says uh, if Scott is picking the players to buy how can you keep sacking the managers I don't know uh, who's getting them in James reckons that Dobbo should have been offered at three years uh, no questions asked maybe he could help Coventry flourish but maybe, maybe again it comes down to the to, to the the amount he's been offered as well rather than just just the terms um in terms of the length Dean said it's a disgrace the way that Dobbo has been treated it's all well and good look at letting Corey and Dobbo go but they aren't replacing them with with the same quality or better, uh, we're going backwards. I mean, just from my personal point of view, like of all the players we've had over the last few years, like what I, I'd shock to see the criticism that Dobbo's getting. Like, how can you watch some of the players that have come through this side and just like meandered through crap seasons and lazy performances, and then you pick up one of the players who's actually cared, who feels like he's not getting a good deal, and like and and have a go at him? One one of the players who's actually given us some moments to be proud of. Like, I don't get a criticism personally, but this is where we are. Uh, right, let's bring in our guest fan. Hopefully he's going to cheer us up, although probably not because he, he watched it yesterday as well. Um, Callum Alston uh, was at the game uh, yesterday and joins us now on, on Charlton Live. Um, morning, Callum. Good to have you on. Uh, how you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, yeah. I hope you can hear me and everything. everything's okay. Yeah, sounds, uh, sound, you sound good, mate. Um, where do you want to start? Then? Do, do, do you want to talk about Dobbo first, just because we were just talking about him? What, what do you make of the whole, the whole situation with, with George? 
I think that the first thing is we somehow have 47 central midfielders, but losing Dobson means we only have one player to play in that central defensive midfield position. It sums up, um, to me, Andy Scott's squad building. We have this massively bloated squad, loads of players on lots of money, um, ownership that has been putting their hands in their pocket, whether or not they're spending on the right players or not. And yet, at times this season, we've still relied on bringing kids through. We've had, we had Anderson playing multiple games early in the season, just not looking quite ready yet. We just didn't play games, not looking quite ready yet. And I think that with Dobson, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm less high on Dobson than a lot of people are. I, I have been historically. I think he's a player that, that looks very good um, in, a, in an average side. I, I don't know if he's a player that, just in my opinion, that, that when you're on the ball a lot, that when you're playing uh, heavily possession style football, I'm not sure he necessarily fits that style of gameplay in the way that Coventry does. But saying that, to let him go now with six months to go to lose your club captain after losing probably our best player when, you know, if you include availability with Chucks, I think I think is criminal. Um, I, I can't understand that decision. It seems from what's happened behind the scenes as well that there's been some real sort of rancor between... Dobson and Scott, and that's part of, part, part of what's led to the position that we're in. So to me, I, I think it shows that it's just an absolute mess um, in uh, at that technical director level. And I think that, that that's the problem that I see. It's a real worry going forward. Morning, Callum. Thanks for joining us this morning, mate. Um, just while well, you've mentioned it there a few times, I think I know what your answer is. Um, and I mentioned Farini earlier, who wasn't involved at all yesterday. But what was your overall reaction to, to our January transfer business? Um, do you think it was a positive one? Or do you think that, well, I think I know the answer because you just said that you think it's a mess. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts on these players? So the, the thing for me is I think it's a mess because we still have players here that are on long-term contracts on loads of money. Conor McGrandall's on the reported wage that he's on. You know, yes, he gave us that wonderful moment at Portsmouth, but the reason it was so wonderful is because he's been so awful every other game that he's played for us. So, but we're stuck with, um, you know, and that's nothing personal towards Conor McGrandall's. He just hasn't fit the way that we've wanted to find him multiple different managers. But we signed these players who don't fit the style of play that we want to play, but we keep changing the manager, so we keep changing the style of play. So the play, so McGrandall's, when he has looked okay, looked okay under Appleton. Appleton's gone. Jones, uh, you know, goes straight on, straight out on loan back to Lincoln. And we're stuck paying part of the wages for these players. And so we're in this thing where we're paying all this money for a squad that's bloated, for players that don't fit. I look at it and I go, I think Gillespie ultimately long-term will be a good player for us. But yesterday in the first half, there was a ball that came down past Eddin and Gillespie's just not match sharp. He tries to slide in. He thinks he's going to get to it. And then he realises, oh, I'm not quite as fast as I thought I was. He has to slide in, completely misses it. And we get lucky the ball just about goes out for, for a goal kick. And, you know, that's those are the sorts of moments that we've got all over the pitch. And that's why we're in the position that we're in. We bought these players that were half fit in January that probably after a summer will look good. I think Edmunds Green will look good after a summer. But we don't have the time to wait till the summer to get those players coming through and it's weird things it's things like Ness playing three games in a row and then just not being on the squad sheet well we're going to have that now until the end of the season we're going to have players that are just dropped out of the squad because we don't have the squad places Terry Taylor who I think is going to be really really important for us played 90 minutes a week and a half ago was in full training we haven't seen him <laughs> where is he <laughs> What I, I just I think that the squad building the, there's there's something fundamentally wrong and it's going to require a real route out in the summer, you know whether we go down to League Two and it's forced on us or whether we stay in this league and we've got to somehow get rid of these players on on these high wages and that that's the problem to me at the moment. <clears throat> and so I suppose the relegation battle then because um, I came on and said. I thought there was reasons to be cheerful. Um, it's probably not as I don't feel it's quite as doom and gloom because we've got Jones and, and a couple of things that are coming back towards us. What's your feelings? Are you particularly scared of relegation? Do you think that there are reasons to be cheerful? Have you given up already? Where do you sit on that spectrum? It's ridiculous. I mean, it might sound slightly ridiculous, but you can't give up when you have Chuck Sneaky coming back. Quite, quite frankly, we are in this place where you take the 12 points that Chuck won us partially in those five or six games in which he was fit, you take those points out and we we are long gone. 
Um, you know, but you can include Corey Bucket as assist in that. So, you know, it's another player that we lost. But I look at it and I go, that's the hope. But how long does that hope last? Two games, five games, six games? Can we get them to 12 games? And that's the real concern. So I was talking to to one of the guys that I go to football with um, coming back yesterday. I said, is there a potential that you just throw the nuclear option on? Do you just start Chucks on Tuesday and say we have to win that game of football? Right? None of us want to see it. But we're in a place where we so desperately just need to score a goal um, that that's what's given me hope is I go, well, for about six games, um, I look at Bolton and I go, that's, that's a loss. But I can throw Chucks on against Santos for 20 minutes if I'm still in the game with 20 minutes to go. And that, that you know, getting a point there might be the difference between staying up and, and going down. Portsmouth, again, I can throw him on against um, O'Shaughnessy. I can throw him on to be a nuisance when with that gap between defence and midfield moxing, you know, I, I can use a big, strong body to do that. But I look at that and I go, but that means the player that I think has playing, been playing pretty well, and Daniel Carney now isn't in the squad anymore. And so you end up in, in that same sort of situation of, of, do I think that we're down yet? No. Um, we still have games against Carlisle, Chester, uh, Cheltenham. We've got Wickham at the end of the season. We've got a lot of games against teams in mid-table are already going to be on the beach towards that April time. It's, get through the next two weeks, stay in, stay in touch, hopefully have a, a you know, semi-fit chucks and, and, and see where we are. Where, where do you think the blame lies for this season, Callum? Because uh, no matter what happens from now on in, obviously it's, it's been another disaster for us. Where, where, yeah. where, is, is it too simplistic to, to, to pick, obviously, one, one group of people, I guess? So how, how has it come to this? Because I, keep, I, I, I just can't get my head around the fact that we are 15 games from the end of the season, only out of the League One relegation zone on goal difference. I mean, it is. It's absolutely it's shocking. We came into the season that summer. I remember Dean giving that speech about how we want to do something special, right? And I look at it and I go, what's special staying in League One? Um, but I look at it and I go, the problem is, firstly, squad building. You know, that has to go to Scott. You've got to put some blame on the ownership. You know, but, you know, you can put your hand in your pocket, but if you're going to have someone like that picking the players consistently, that can lead to a problem. How do we get into that situation? We sat Dean Holden after six weeks. We go to Darren Ferguson at Peterborough, who said no straight away because he was never going to leave Peterborough. He's on that two-person rotational Peterborough manager hiring carousel thing they do. Um, we got rejected by a guy in the Indian League, who I think now ends up going to Oxford. I believe that's the now Oxford manager. We got rejected by, was it Mellor at Stockport, who I thought would have been a really good option. But he went, I'm not going to that basket case because, I'm, you know, I, I might win the league here with, with this squad. Um, and then finally, we settled on a guy that absolutely none of us thought was, was any good. And it ended up being that it's Andy Scott's mate. And, you know, then we stuck with him because Scott didn't want the embarrassment of sacking him. And those games against Cambridge and Burton, um, you know, twice against Burton, uh, you know, those sorts of games are the difference between between what you know being further up and being where we are. Yes, I know the games one wasn't it wasn't a penalty. But you look at you go, we've somehow found ways to lose games consistently <laughs> in different ways, whether it's one to finishes from sixty yards against Oxford or whether it's sloppy goalkeeping mistakes or whether it's tap into the back post or penalties that aren't penalties. It's it's incredibly frustrating. I mean it's not working. We haven't made that change. I just look at it and I go, we bought players for Appleton in January and then brought in a, brought in a guy who's not going to play the same brand of football. So I look at it and I go, there's blame for Scott, there's blame for ownership, there's blame for Appleton, there's blame even for Holden, you know, I think drumming up expectations that we couldn't meet. You know, there's blame for there's blame for pretty much everybody in that squad, I think, bar maybe Anthony May, bar maybe George Dobson, you know, we didn't... It's just there's, there's so much blame to go around that squad and go around that management. And the whole, the whole thing just seems to be a bit of a mess at the moment. And we mm. we might stay up, but you look at that squad and you go, that squad should be doing a hell of a lot more than just staying up. Mm. Um, and just finally then, looking ahead to Tuesday, Lincoln, um, what what can be changed between now and then? Is it personnel that has to, that has to be switched up to make sure we... I mean, we have to get something on Tuesday, minimum. We have to get something because we need... We, we need to halt this this downward spiral. Uh, I mean, Chuck has to be in that squad, somewhere in that squad. I think that's, you know, the other day, that just has to happen. Um, I've, the, the problem is you can't chop and change those centre-backs. But I look at yesterday and I go, what's Gerald Thomas doing at right centre-back? He's a left-footer. Um, he's been playing really well at left centre-back and he's been moved over to right centre-back. And I'm just like, but I, I wouldn't want to chop and change. I don't think... 
the back three were that poor yesterday. I think I stood was good. You know, I think that's a positive change. The two fullbacks you can't change. So it's like, what what can you change? Maybe in midfield. But to me, the, the big one is Ladapa needs to be dropped. That was awful yesterday. You can't trap a bag of cement. Um, I don't know what's happened, but he's he's so incredibly off the pace that he's got to be dropped. To me, it's Ladapo drop, Carney comes in and EK comes onto the bench. That's the change I would make. And I'd hope that Taylor is fit enough to be on the bench as well to give you a bit more of a creative option to come on to play those final balls through. Well, fingers crossed. Um, Callum, thanks for your time this morning, mate. Thanks for coming on as uh, our guest fan. And uh, fingers crossed that we'll uh, we'll have a happier end to the season than the one we've all just discussed there. <laughs> Yeah, think, thanks for having me on, guys. All right, cheers. That's Callum Alston this week's uh, guest fan on, on Charlton Live. And yeah, just uh, towards the end of it there with uh, with Callum, Ben, we were looking ahead to, to Lincoln on, on Tuesday. You'll, you'll be pleased to hear that they're five games unbeaten, of course, because every team we play uh, at the moment is on a good run of some description. Um, uh, to be fair, that was off the, those five unbeaten games were off the back of four defeats. Uh, they, they, they had three draws, uh, two goalless at home, one away at Wickham, and then they've just gone and beaten Burton away, which is very difficult we found out a few weeks ago. And uh, Fleetwood at home, which we did this season, so that's not even that good a result, actually. But um, yeah, uh, something has to change. They're 10th in, in the league. Uh, uh, they're, the defeat uh, under Michael Appleton against them up at their place, I can't remember if that was the first or second before or after the Bolton game as well, but we'd, we'd lost two in a row, hadn't we? Um, and, and that was the first time under Appleton where we reverted to type what we'd seen over the course of the last year and a half. Uh, and like we were, we were really poor against a, a fairly middling side. We, we, we can't put in a performance like that on, on Tuesday, Ben, because something, something has to click sooner rather than later. It does indeed, mate. And as we were saying about these fixtures, this is one massive game for us at home against the side, as you said, not in the greatest of form. Um, they've had, a couple of wins, a couple of draws, and then on the back of some losses. So they're there for us to try and win this game because Bolton and Portsmouth and Derby, that is going to be very difficult. Um, we need a massive start to this game. Uh, I agree with Callum. I would I would start some... I mean, it's tricky with Aniki. We just don't know his fitness, do we? But I'd, I'd start with Pan, definitely. I mean, the way he came on yesterday... We need that. We need that first half. We need to be in front and looking good in that first half. I, I have no confidence that if we're not at half time, that we've then going to have a big second half and and win the game. I mean, look at yesterday for instance. The game was was pretty nothing at half time, and it was and it was them that then obviously went on to win the game. Um, I really think big first 10 minutes and, and the likes of getting pan on the ball. Um, yeah, I agree with that Terry Taylor comment as well. I think he was supposed to be a real big signing for us this summer. He's played uh, a 90 minutes in the under 21s and then we've, we've not even seen him on the bench. Um, and he is a creative midfielder, uh, supposedly. So yeah, I think we've just got to get players on the pitch that can create stuff. I'd like to see Kane Ramsey start. Um, because he's come with uh, a pedigree of of assisting goals and getting up and down the line. I think that's something we badly need, someone that can take us up the pitch with a bit of pace and power and even just to scare some defenders, just to kind of show that we've got something there. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be a big like opening half an hour for us. I think if we go behind it's going to be a massive struggle. But if we can take the lead, get the fans behind us, get like, unlike yesterday, get the fans cheering for something, have some shots, get some deflections. We haven't done enough of that. Um, just just try and fire us up in some way. And if we do see Chucks there, that will massively fire us up, mm. fire the fans up. Because as we've said, I know it's fans don't like to hang their hat on him because, yeah, with the injuries, but he is a game changer. He is a cheat code in this league. If if somehow we can get him out there for 20 minutes, half an hour, that'll be massive for us. Mm, excellent. Right, we've run out of time uh, on this week's Charlton Live. Thanks for everyone who's listening. Yeah, there's a few comments to, to get Pan in or Ramsey in, in the chat as well there. So, yeah, some fans calling for some change in the starting lineup, but we'll see what happens uh, on Tuesday. Yeah, so thanks for everyone who's joined us 
uh, live in the live stream uh, this morning. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can join us live uh, every Sunday and every Thursday when we're on. It's 10 a.m. on Sundays, 7 p.m. on the Thursday evening. Massive thanks to Callum, who was our guest fan this week, spoke uh, very well indeed. Um, big thanks to Ben and Joe for joining me on the show this morning. Good to speak to you too. Cheers, chaps. Group therapy always works. Yeah, it hasn't worked for me, actually. I'm still pretty uh, down in the dumps about all that yesterday. Maybe Tuesday will cheer me up. Uh, right, I'm Louis Meadows. Uh, thanks for listening to Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. We'll be back on Thursday to look back at that game against Lincoln and ahead to next Saturday's trip up to Bolton. We shall see you then. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.